Eyewitness News with Harry Martin and Sarah Wallace. Mark Stevens with sports. Veronica Johnson with the exclusive AccuWeather forecast and the Eyewitness News team. Now, Eyewitness News. Good evening, I'm Sarah Wallace. This last crucial weekend of campaigning is coming to a close as the candidates count down to election. In New York City, it's a dead heat between Rudy Giuliani and Mayor Dinkins, and both candidates are going all out for undecided voters. Mayor Dinkins brought out some star power today. Danny Glover and Dr. Ruth helped him pitch for votes. Giuliani's schedule included a touch of Hollywood. Actor Ron Silver showed up to help Giuliani campaign for liberal Democratic voters. Tim Mitten begins our coverage of the campaign on the trail with Mayor Dinkins. He may be having a good time, but David Dinkins came to Ratner's Lower East Side Deli for more than babies and locks. Joined by a quintet of mostly Jewish United States senators, the mayor reached out yet again to New Yorkers still critical of his response to the 1991 riot that killed Jewish scholar Yankel Rosenbaum. It's necessary for them to understand that I have said uh, of Crown Heights that I made a mistake in not insisting 24 hours earlier that the police alter their tactics, and I accept blame for that. We've learned from that. Yes, he made a mistake. I just heard him say he made a mistake. But once you make a mistake, that doesn't blemish an entire <coughs> record of commitment, of concern for Jews, of concern for Israel. The mayor's pre-election concern also runs to his core support. He went to a Brooklyn Baptist church with Jesse Jackson to encourage people to vote. Four more years! Thank you. Four more years! And then the Upper West Side, where the mayor brought stars, including Danny Glover, Celeste Holm, and Dr. Ruth. But on a raw, wet day, the crowd on stage all but outnumbered the crowd below, which doesn't bother Governor Cuomo as much as the polls. I don't understand why Dinkins isn't way, way ahead. Uh, I'll take a one-vote victory, but he deserves a victory by a very large margin if you limit yourself to the facts and the substance and the issues. Mayor Dinkins describes himself today as cautiously optimistic. And as he crisscrosses the city in pursuit of votes from Jews and undecided liberals, he'll visit three boroughs in 12 hours. A hectic schedule, but one similar to that being undertaken by challenger Rudolph Giuliani. And senior correspondent John Johnson joins us now with that part of the political story. This is John Johnson with the Giuliani campaign, the gentler, all-inclusive campaign of the Republican liberal candidate who has begun to emphasize a unity theme for all New Yorkers down the home stretch. Aimed at ethnic undecideds and shaky Democrats, the theme is to encourage crossover voters not to feel any guilt voting for a Republican. A lot of the politics we're hearing today is kind of agree with us or feel guilty. I don't feel guilty. I feel very proud. The gathering of Democrats for Giuliani heard the candidate sound a lot like a Democrat with his message of healing for the city. But all of the divisions that we now feel between and among people, there's no reason for all those divisions. The last minute appeal for the crossover voting is evidence we that really the Giuliani do. camp really thinks the election the is close. So close, the Giuliani campaign has asked and received from the United States Attorney's Office federal observers for election day. The next stop for candidate Giuliani, the Council of Jewish Organizations and Civil Service, where they too heard the message, we're all New Yorkers in this together. Is this a new and warm and gentler riddle of Giuliani, Giuliani, the unifier of the city? Well, I think that uh, we have a sense that uh, we're going to win the election, and what, we're, what we want to do, really, what we want to do, whether we win or lose, as I did on the night of my concession speech four years ago, is make certain that there's the right spirit in this city, both on election day and the day after. So it was Rudolph Giuliani, the unifier, the message during this last days of the campaign, softer and gentler than in past. In fact, Mr. Giuliani, using one of Mayor Dinkins' themes, that he will be mayor of all the people, the common bond appeal, even for Democrats. Reporting from Midtown Manhattan, I'm John Johnson, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. And in this race for mayor, voters who are still making up their minds could be the deciding factor in this Tuesday's election. The latest polls show that it's just too close to call. And political correspondent Pat Dawson joins us tonight with details. Pat? Harry, in their rhetoric, the candidates would have us believe that this is one city, seven million people with a shared perspective. In some ways, perhaps, but New York is really a city of neighborhoods. 
So we went in search of undecided votes in three crucial neighborhoods. Listen carefully and you'll hear the faint but unmistakable rumbling of New Yorkers' discontent, the common thread in this year's mayoral campaign. It's the lesser of two evils. <laughs> I'm voting for the lesser of two evils, I guess. The, le the lesser of the two evils, I don't know if that's the answer. Like a Greek chorus, New Yorkers sounded their dissatisfaction over and over again in a series of interviews over the last week. From shoppers on Queens Boulevard to Broadway in the 80s to rainwashed strollers in Brooklyn Heights today, we found voters still struggling with their choice in the final hours. Ralph Fisher describes himself as a liberal Democrat. I haven't. It's a tough one to pick, yeah. What, what, what makes it more difficult than other years? Well, I'm not satisfied with uh, the Dankins. Another recurring sentiment. To many liberal voters who should be easy pickings for the mayor, he has a competence problem. There's a sense the city is declining. But Rudolph Giuliani seems to have a likability problem. I just don't care for him somehow. But not because of his party. The good news for Giuliani is that virtually no one we spoke to cared about his Republican roots. The bad news is a frequently raised opinion that he's just too hard-nosed. The challenger does seem to have capitalized on the most potent political theme of last year. I will, am a staunch Democrat, have been my whole life, but I'm voting for the change. Since most polls register undecided voters in single digits, the race will likely turn the way they do. But in our thoroughly unscientific sampling, they haven't moved yet. When do you suppose you'll make up your mind? Probably when I walk in the booth and pull the handle. <laughs> Among voters who were committed, the result was interesting. In Brooklyn Heights and on the west side, white neighborhoods where the mayor did quite well last time, Giuliani was almost even. But in parts of Queens where Giuliani's expected to win handily, the mayor was surprisingly strong. Which leaves us with about as many questions as we started with. Absolutely. Sure. All right. Thank Thanks, you, Pat. Pat. And the pace is just as fast and furious in the Garden State, where the race for governor is still a tight one. Jim Florio courted voters at a rally in Piscataway. He picked up two more newspaper endorsements, the Newark Star-Ledger and the News Tribune of Woodbridge. And challenger Christy Whitman took a page from Florio's playbook, campaigning with her own Washington heavyweight. Lucy Yang reports from New Jersey. Washington came to New Jersey today to stump for the gubernatorial candidates at Giant Stadium. Senate Minority Leader Bob Dole braved the cold rain to support Republican candidate Christine Todd Whitman. When a local radio station tried to press Dole on football, he tossed the ball back to politics. Well, I can cheer for the Giants. I can cheer for the Redskins. You know, I can cheer for the Chiefs. <laughs> There were a number of Halloween faces in today's tailgate crowd as Whitman called to change the face of the governor. Can't afford to continue to lose jobs and businesses, and that's what this election is all about, that uh, yes. we can make that change, we can control the way government does its business, we can control the rate at which it spends money, and we can leave more money in the taxpayers' pockets. Meanwhile, at Rutgers University, Senator Bill Bradley, who almost lost his seat to Whitman in his last election, came out to pull for Governor Jim Florio, telling this crowd that the incumbent is a fighter who will not be knocked out of the ring because of his multi-billion dollar tax hike in 1990. Although Florio leads in most polls, there are still many undecided voters, enough of a block to keep both candidates hopping. I want 100 percent turnout. And we're working to bring everybody out. Is Are you it nervous about the undecided voters? Well, I'm, I'm always concerned about the election. That's why we're working so hard. As for all the undecided voters on this Halloween night, they are still trying to decide if Florio has more tax tricks up his sleeve or if Whitman can deliver the tax cut treats she promised. In Piscataway, New Jersey, Lucy Yang, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. And be sure to watch Channel 7 on Tuesday for complete election coverage. We will provide you with live, up-to-the-minute results, plus exit poll analysis throughout Tuesday night. Plus, we'll have an expanded special edition of Eyewitness News at 11. But coming up right now, next on Eyewitness News, here much more news, including a shocking act of violence in Westchester County. A manhunt is underway in Mount Vernon for a suspect who shot two police officers. One of them is critically wounded. Plus, the mysterious death of actor River Phoenix. Stay with us, we'll tell you about it. Nobody. 
All followed by Eyewitness News. Tonight, right here on Channel 7. Jeopardy! To win, you gotta play it. Play it? Get in on all the fun and excitement. See it, say it, play it. Jeopardy! Tomorrow at 7, right here on Channel 7. Tonight, police in Mount Vernon are searching for a gunman who is suspected of going on a weekend rampage against cops. Investigators say that he opened fire on two police officers and critically wounded one of them last night. Jada Dapper reports. A routine Saturday night beat patrol became a brush with death for two Mount Vernon police officers when a man they were trailing spun around and began firing. Officer Leary Johnson was wounded in the head. He's in critical but stable condition at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx. His partner, Leroy Palmer, was hit in the thigh and is in satisfactory condition. Police believe the gunman is 20-year-old Daniel James, who was with a group of people that turned into a courtyard just as Johnson called out his name. He said something to the effect that he wasn't going to take this anymore, and then he turned and fired on the officers. James got away as he had the night before when other officers were preparing to arrest him. We have a large... Uh, population in that area, many of which loiter in the area for the use of drugs and gambling. They were moving crowds in the area, and he was part of that crowd that night, and he was going to be arrested for uh, disorderly conduct at that time when he resisted, struck the officers, and escaped the area. These are the first officers shot in Mount Vernon in more than 15 years. I think it tends to support the, the tendency on the part of the society as a whole to become more violent prone. And we hope this is not an indication of what the Mount Vernon Police Department can expect in the future. Since the shooting, police have been searching for James at a host of addresses across Westchester County, but so far to no avail. They hope by releasing the photograph to the public, they'll get some help and be able to find him before he shoots again. In Mount Vernon, J.D. Dapper, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Now, police say that James has been charged with assault in the past and is due in court next week on a drug charge. Sarah? Federico Fellini, one of the world's most imaginative and original film directors, has died. Fellini had been in a coma since suffering a heart attack two weeks ago. The Italian director was known for his mix of sensuality and fantasy. He directed 20 feature films, among them La Dolce Vita, made in 1959. It was condemned by the Vatican as obscene. Fellini was 73 years old. He died in Rome. And the mysterious death of actor River Phoenix is also shaking the film community tonight. You see him here wearing glasses. The 23-year-old Phoenix collapsed early this morning and died a short time later. It happened outside a West Hollywood nightclub. Phoenix's friends say he had been acting strangely shortly before he collapsed. The young actor made his name in such films as Stand By Me in My Own Private Idaho. An autopsy is scheduled to determine the cause of Phoenix's death. When we come back, a big day in sports and also a local rivalry. Mark Stevens coming up next with highlights of a major gridiron faceoff between the Jets and the Giants. It's a matchup with a surprise ending. And a major injury in the Kansas City-Miami game. A star player carried off the field. We'll tell you who it is next in sports. Every time Mercedes-Benz introduces a new car, other car companies rush to follow. Broadway's Men's Golf Theater see Michael Damian and Joseph in the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoats. Call today and go, 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 Joseph. Mark Stevens in sports details about the uh, Giants, the Jets, and uh, the prediction you'd like to forget. Yeah, a lot of people want to forget it. I guess we can all <laughs> color New York green tonight. The Big Apple bragging rights surprisingly belong to the Jets, who did what they had to do. The Giants could have blown them out in the first half. They didn't. That's why the Jets win the Empire Stakes 10 to 6. And I can't figure this guy out. Is he a Jet fan or a Giant fan? And did he have to pay for LTC? Should have. Opening were generous with the spot, and then, then the Jets capped off the drive with Baxter. Going straight ahead for the only touchdown of the game, 10-6, the Jets led it. Giants had their chances late, but Phil Simms wasn't sharp today. Intercepted there by Ronnie Lott. His second of the year was the next-to-last nail in the coffin. The final one came with just seconds remaining. Simms on fourth down. This bragging tonight, they win the Battle of New York. Scott Clark has more from the Meadowlands. This is, this is basically their season, and this good old classic kind of football game in the rain and the drizzle ends up the Jets on top. For the entire week, we had to listen how we were the, uh, you know, the basic stepchild, and you know, I think it motivated us somewhat, but in the, there's no question we're very happy. For us to make the mistakes we did a couple times uh, down there when we, you know, had them going, and uh, 
So hell, they should be happy. As long as you keep building and keep learning from situations like this, hey, uh, the sky's the limit. Scott Clark, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Well, injury overshadowed accomplishment today in the game in Miami between the Dolphins and the Chiefs. In the second quarter, Casey loses Joe Montana again. The same hamstring injury. He didn't return. Then on this play, the Chiefs' Harvey Williams blasted by Brian Cox. Now, Williams fought on the field for 18 minutes. Head and neck injuries were feared. Fortunately, though, spinal x-rays were negative. Williams suffered a concussion. For the Fish, Scott at 30 to 10, makes Don Shula a winner for the 324th time in his career, ties him for George Hallis for number one all time. A cold shower, Shula will remember. Also, Dallas is leading Philly in the third. The Niners are up on the Rams, and Green Bay beat the Bears 17 to three. Phoenix is leading New Orleans. The Raiders and Chargers are tied. Denver is leading Seattle. Tampa Bay beats Atlanta, and it's Indy out field goaling New England nine to six. The Rangers and the Devils had to cross a lot more than just the Hudson River to go head to head today in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Three minutes into the game, Rangers on the power play. Sergei Zuboff took the shot, but there Mike Gartner deflected it in. That's all the scoring. Rangers are leading it one to nothing midway through the first. In golf, you saw it was Jim Gallagher's day at the Tour Championship at the Olympic Club in San Francisco. That's his tee shot on 13. That one there led to an easy birdie. Now Gallagher was tied with Greg Norman, who bogeyed four of the final nine holes. He needed that putt on 18 to stay tied. He missed it. Gallagher wins the tour. It's worth more than a half million dollars. And finally, a ladies first. Last night in Lidwood, Washington, those are ladies boxing folks. The first ever sanctioned female boxing match in the United States. 16-year-old Dallas Malloy in the gray top won a court battle to hold the fight. And then she went out and won the fight. And now she says she'd like to have ladies boxing in the Olympics. I don't think so. Why That'll not? do it in sports. I'm Mark Stevens. You're in trouble again. Big Got a trouble. long way to go. <laughs> Why not? Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Well, yeah. when will the sun <laughs> return? Meteorologist Veronica Johnson coming up next with the AccuWeather forecast. Well, there may be no sun, but it is certainly a very bright scene in Greenwich Village, and we will take you live to the Halloween parade next. This is an Eagle Vision, a sophisticated American sports sedan that's equipped with a 3.3-liter V6 engine, touring suspension, four-wheel disc brakes, even driver and front passenger airbags. Little children will be tricking and treating tonight, but Halloween is also for big kids. And right now, they're gathering for what just might be the country's biggest Halloween parade. You're looking at a live picture in Greenwich Village, where thousands are expected to show up tonight. This is the 20th Village Halloween Parade. This year's theme, incidentally, Creatures of the Night. Certainly not an evening for the faint of heart. No, let's hope that those costumes are amazing. Let's just hope that the rain clears out, will it? Uh, it's going to be slow to clear out. Certainly not tonight. It looks like the storm system is moving just a little slower than what we expected. We've had the light rain on and off today, and one thing that has been slow to move up to have been our temperatures. The mercury now stands at 44 degrees, humidity 96%, quite saturated. It's raining outside, of course. Barometric pressure, it's rising, but it's going to fall off again with another storm system that is moving into our region. Our winds out of the northeast at 12 miles per hour. They have been today, and it's the strong northeasterly flow that kept the temperatures down. Our high temperature, in fact, 45 degrees, was reached at 1 a.m. this morning, and our low, 41 at 10 p.m. Let's take a look at that storm system now on a satellite. The low-pressure system is sitting just off the coast of the Delmarva. It will move northward tonight. It's going to be slow to clear our area by tomorrow morning. I'll start tracking more toward the north and east, but the clouds will still be with us during the early part of the day. Now, from underneath the clouds, the rain has been falling. It's been spotty throughout the area, a little heavier as we head into areas west over toward uh, Sullivan, and then we go into the snow up toward Watertown, Buffalo, and a little bit snow all the way down toward the Appalachians. This is rain over eastern Pennsylvania. It's all heading to the northeast at about 30 miles per hour. So I expect more spotty rain tonight and perhaps a passing shower tomorrow morning. Let's take a look at the rainfall amounts as of today. This is 27 hour rainfall amounts. Newark at an inch just under that ice slip and just over three quarters of an inch at LaGuardia and Central Park. And more rain is on the way. With the rain dreary and wet today, this low pressure system moving up, high pressure moving down is what's creating the strong 
winds. They're going to gust easily up to 20 miles per hour tonight. And with the strong winds and the light rain, area temperatures will fall into the 40s for many in the inland areas and out toward the island, 30s up toward areas north. Tomorrow, some improvement. It'll be slow. The low pressure heads off toward the north and east. The sun, perhaps it'll peek through by the late afternoon. Tonight, though, again, more fog, more strong winds, and more rain. So just stay the way you are, prepared. Tomorrow, yeah, we're going to rise to 52 degrees. We're looking for the sun to come through by the afternoon, a passing shower early in the day, and then we're going to drop down on the cold side, partly cloudy with still stiff winds to continue blowing throughout the area. AccuWeather forecast for the next couple of days says a little bit of rain on Monday, but it looks dry for the next five days, 58 degrees on Thursday, then cooling back by the next weekend. Kind of a ghoulish forecast That's tonight. Right. That's right. Thanks. Thanks. That's it for us. We'll see you back here tonight at 11. Bye-bye. Good night.